Welcome everybody to another episode of the Joseph Carlson Show. On this episode, we're going to be talking about a new purchase in my portfolio. This is a company that I've recently made as an addition to the portfolio. It's Wynn Resorts. That's it. Wynn Resorts, the casino resort gambling business. I bought a little bit of this company to get exposure to what I think might be a good recovery play. Now, this company does come with its own set of risks. There's some things that you have to be aware of if you want to jump into these type of recovery plays. So in this episode, I'm going to be outlining what I think are the biggest risks, the most potential downside with Win Resorts, and what I think the upside could be if things go well next year, if they go well with the recovery. So we'll be talking about both parts of this type of purchase. Now, of course, we have some news to get to. Salesforce may be buying Slack the chat application. I think this would be an extraordinary pickup for Salesforce. So I'm gonna be going over this and why I think this would be such a good thing for Salesforce to do. It obviously benefits both companies. People that have been holding Slack have not had too good of a run this year compared to other technology companies, but now they're getting rewarded for being longtime followers of Slack, longtime shareholders. So this is an exciting day for both Salesforce shareholders and Slack shareholders. I'm gonna talk about this news and why I think it's so good for Salesforce. And then we also have some bad news for Nikola, our favorite company, Nikola, the car company that rolled a vehicle down a hill and then filmed it as though it was propelling itself. This company's stock price fell 27% today. So a minor dip in their stock price. And that, of course, is because GM has decided that they're trying to back away from this deal a little bit. They're backing away from the agreement with Nikola. Not entirely, but they're definitely moving away from them. So we're going to take a look at that, what GM is actually doing and why both of the company's stock prices have fallen today. So we have a lot to get to, as well as, of course, comments and questions that I'll be responding to at the end of this episode. Now, before we jump into that, I have to plug the Patreon. It helps support the channel. If you join today, you'll get the entire month for free. You have a long free trial to try this out. You can cancel any time. There's no risk involved with it. It gives you access to a dividend tracking website. It gives you access to nine exclusive episodes of the Joseph Carlson Show, as well as a Discord community with over a thousand active members. So it's a lot of fun. If you're interested, there's a link in the description. Okay, let's first jump into the portfolio and talk about this new holding, Win Resorts. Now, as you might see with my portfolio, I have a lot of recovery plays. These are companies that have been, they've been really damaged by the coronavirus. They're companies that the stock price dropped dramatically since March when we realized the full effects of the coronavirus, and they haven't fully recovered yet. You're talking about companies like Store Capital. That's one that went down in value a lot in March, and it's since been recovering, and I've earned quite a bit of money in capital appreciation from this company. Another one is obviously any bank. They also got really hurt in March of this year. Some of them have recovered more than others, but JP Morgan is another company that I consider a recovery play. It's a company that's recovering over this year and the next couple years. Um, another one is Disney. That's a company that obviously was devastated by the coronavirus, and it's since been recovering in stock price. Disney's one that's now almost at its all-time highs. So investors are starting to realize and price in the value of their streaming service. So these are the type of companies that I've been betting on for the past few months, and all of them have done really well so far. And I've been in search for additional companies that I could buy at depressed valuations in hopes that that business will recover over the next year. I landed on a company called Wynn Resorts, which is a hotel and high-end casino business. Now, I want to say first and foremost, this is a riskier holding than most of these other companies. I think that Wynn Resorts, everything considered, is a more risky bet than Store Capital or JP Morgan or Disney. So if you're thinking about investing in the hotel business, realize that there's a lot of risks, there's a lot of unforeseen events in the future that you can't really account for that could change the outcome of this investment. So I'm going to go over in this episode all the risks and the potential downside with this holding, and what I see as the bull case. If things go well and the economy does recover really well and we get past the coronavirus, what I see the potential upside with this company. So we're gonna go over all of it. Now, before jumping into all of that, I have to mention Jeremy from the YouTube channel, Financial Education. He's come out with a couple videos on Win Resorts. This is a company that he's very bullish on. So he's investing a lot more money than I am. He's apparently putting in $100,000 into the stock. So he's very bullish on it. He lays out his thesis on the company, his bull case on it. I've watched this video and it's where I got the idea initially to look at this stock. And I agree with him for the most part. He thinks that the company will make a strong rebound over the next couple years. And I share in that optimism. But if you want to check out additional research, he does have a couple videos on this stock. Now let's jump into Win Resorts. Before we go into the risks of the company and the potential upside, I want to take a quick look of what this business actually is. Win Resorts is a high-end luxury casino and hotel business. 
That's what they do. They have really high-end five-star resorts all across the world. They have locations in Vegas. They have a location in Boston Harbor, Massachusetts that's relatively new. This is called the Wynn Encore. And they also have a lot of presence in Macau with the Wynn Palace right on Katai. And this place is a ridiculous luxury resort. This is kind of like their flagship place. Now, they have all these locations all across the world. Macau is where they earn the majority of their revenue. So this is actually where the majority of their business is. If you're not familiar, Macau is apparently becoming kind of the Las Vegas of the East. This has really become the central gambling area of the world. So it's a really important property. They've also recently announced that they have a plan for a $2 billion crystal pavilion. That's an art museum. So, so this should bring in more revenue and visitors down the road. This is supposed to be completed in 2024. But in a nutshell, that's Wynn's business. They have high-end resorts, casinos, conventions, dining, all that good stuff that comes along with it. Now, obviously, with that type of business in today's environment, it hasn't been doing well in the coronavirus. And that's where all the risks and downside come with this business. So let's go ahead and talk about the situation that Wynn Resort's in and the potential risks that are associated with it, which I think are many. So these risks are not to be downplayed. Let's go ahead and look at some of them. Problem number one with Wynn Resorts, and this is obviously the big one. The coronavirus is spreading out of control across the world and especially across the U.S., this just makes travel less likely. When people are getting sick and there's a disease spreading around, everybody just wants to stay home. You don't wanna go out and go to a resort. That's not really what's on your mind. And right now we're reaching a point where over 200,000 people are testing positive for the coronavirus a day. This has recently gone down at least for like one or two days, but it's still really bad. And we are not anywhere in the clear right now. So the coronavirus is surging. It's the worst wave of it that we've ever had. And the outlook is unknown. So that's the first risk with this company. When resorts cannot operate and be profitable with the coronavirus surging, as long as this is going on, when resorts is losing money, a million dollars or $2 million per day. So every day that this drags on, the more money that when resorts loses, the more money that they lose, the more debt they have to take on and the worse situation that they're in. So the timeline of the coronavirus is incredibly important to this business. The next thing that we can look at as kind of a gauge of how harmed Wynn's business has been is the amount of travelers that we have generally. The amount of travelers going through TSA checkpoints has dropped dramatically from this year to last year. For instance, if we look at the 29th, there is 1.1 million people that went through the TSA checkpoints in 2020. The same day last year, 2,800,000 people, so over twice as many. The same thing with every single day, 964,000, 2,600,000. So more people were traveling last year by two or three times. And that is a problem for Wynn Resorts because less travelers means less potential business. If we look at another illustration, this actually gives it a little bit more clarity. The dark blue lines here are this current year, so 2020. That's how many people are traveling every single day this year. And then the comparison are these tall, really black lines. This is 2019. So you can see how many people are traveling this year compared to last year. The numbers aren't even close. You can see that in March of this year, traveling went down to almost nothing. There was almost nobody in airports. They were completely empty, just a couple thousand people going through TSA checkpoints every single day, compared to the over 2 million people that went every day last year. So traveling went to almost zero in March and April of this year, and all those unknowns of the coronavirus, we had no clue what it was. We didn't know how deadly it was. We didn't know how to fight it. We really had no idea of what it was. So people were really scared. Not a lot of people were traveling. And you could see travel pick up a little bit in May and then in June and then in July. And then it's picked up pretty slowly from there, slowly eking up month over month. But travel has been increasing. We're getting to the point where we're kind of halfway there. We're back to about 50% of the travel that we were doing the year prior. This is a problem for Wynn's business. Every day that we have less travelers, every day that people are afraid to go on vacation is more money lost for this company, and that's money that they're not getting back anytime soon. And you can see the effects the coronavirus and the slack of travel has had on Wynn's business. They went from being into the green every single year and being a profitable company with a positive net income to now going into the red more and more every single quarter to the point where they're losing almost $1 billion a quarter. So that's a lot of money that they've lost. Last quarter, they reported a $758 million loss. So that's a lot of money for this company to be losing. And we can also see this over their long-term debt. Wynn has had to add on billions of dollars to their long-term debt simply because they're trying to raise cash and get in a better position to weather this storm, to make it through the coronavirus. They don't wanna to have to sell off their locations. 
They don't want to have to sell off hotels or, or change any of their future plans. So what they're doing is they're taking on more debt and they're raising their cash position just so they can make it through the next couple years. So these are what I think are the biggest risks for Wynn Resorts. The coronavirus surging, people are afraid to travel, they're not going on vacation with confidence, there's not many conventions or people wanting to go to Vegas and enjoy themselves at a resort like they normally would with the coronavirus going on. And then of course this leading to a decrease in foot traffic, leading to an increase of debt because they're not making as much money as they have been historically. All of these are serious risks that shouldn't be taken lightly. Now that we've looked at some of the risks and the downside, let's look at the potential upside and the bull case for this company. Obviously, for one thing, we have the vaccines. These look like they're going to happen. Moderna just asked health regulators today to get approval for theirs. So they could be approved very soon and they could start distributing their vaccine by the end of this year. And they estimate that Pfizer could be in the same situation. So we could have two different vaccines from two different companies, both being distributed starting the end of December. That's very soon. Now, there's some health officials that say that there's going to be enough vaccinations available to the U.S. that everybody that wants to be vaccinated could be by July. That's how soon they think that they'll have enough available for everyone. Not everyone will take one. Of course, there's people with concerns. But even if a good portion of the U.S. does take the vaccination, I think we'll see a dramatic decrease in the spread of coronavirus. So I think that next year, as the vaccines are widely available and many people that choose to get them grow in immunity, we hopefully will see a diminishing in the coronavirus cases. We hopefully will see that go down. And as a result, I think people will be much more likely to start to think about going on vacation and finally getting out of the house and, and doing something that's outside at a resort that's a lot more fun than what they've been doing for the past year. So my guess is that the amount of travelers next year will see a steady increase month over month. Now, the next thing I have to mention in terms of a bull case for these type of recovery stocks is obviously the monetary policy that we're likely to receive over the next year. Jerome Powell is staying in the Fed chair. I don't think that Biden will remove him. And even if he does, his term's not up until the beginning of 2022. So we're going to have Jerome Powell for a while. And we know that Jerome Powell likes to give out a lot of money. He likes to help businesses. He's doing everything he can to put as much cash in businesses and people's pockets as possible. That's good for companies like Wynn Resorts. They do benefit from that. And I think that we're likely going to see a lot more financial stimulus over the next year. In addition to Jerome Powell being the Fed chair, we also know that Janet Yellen was the pick for Treasury Secretary. And if you don't know Janet Yellen, she was the former Fed chair and she did very similar things as Jerome Powell. She did quantitative easing. She lowered the interest rates. She also did everything she could to help the economy. So both of them are likely going to see eye to eye on things. They're both going to help out the economy and businesses and individuals as much as they possibly can. So between the two of these, between the Treasury and between the Fed, we have a very accommodating government. I think that we're likely to see a lot of financial stimulus, a lot of support to businesses over the next couple years. Now, another positive thing for Wynn Resorts in particular is its cash balance. This is a bright spot on its balance sheet. A lot of the debt that they've raised recently is just to increase their cash balance so that they're in a better position to go through the coronavirus. And right now, Wynn Resorts has about $3.7 billion in cash. $3.7 billion is a very good cash balance for this company. To put that in perspective, according to Morningstar's research, they say as of August 2020, the company has enough liquidity to operate with near zero revenue through 2021. That means that they have enough cash to operate all through next year without earning any money, without earning any revenue, which of course is extremely unlikely. So this company is in a very strong cash position right now. Of course, they don't want to burn all of that cash with the coronavirus. They'd rather retain it and become profitable again. But heaven forbid they don't earn any money through 2021. They're still in a situation where they don't have to sell off core assets. Some other companies that are recovery plays right now don't have the same cash balance. Carnival Cruise Line is one of them. This is a company that ran out of cash and they're selling off core assets to be able to stay in business. They're selling off 18 of their cruise ships, which is about 12% of their fleet. So this is what happens when a company runs out of all of its cash and it can't take on any more debt. They have to sell off core assets of the business to be able to stay afloat. That's what Carnival Cruise Line is doing right now. Wynn Resorts is not in the same position and they won't be in that position unless we go an entire year without any recovery which again, I think is unlikely. It could happen, but I think that that is the unlikely scenario. 
Now, just to review the risks and the bull case for this company. Under the risks, we have the coronavirus. That's obviously the big one. It's surging right now. It's kind of out of control. We have people that are afraid to travel. People feel like they're in danger. They don't want to go out and go on vacation. So a lot of people are still staying home. They're not traveling because the coronavirus is surging. On top of that, we have debt levels increasing for this company because they're not having as many visitors, they're not filling up their rooms and their casinos, so they're taking on a lot of losses every single quarter. The bull case is that vaccines are coming and they're gonna be here very quickly. I think that we're gonna see the first distribution of them early this year and then we're gonna be manufacturing them and distributing them all throughout the year. So I think in 2021, there's gonna be a wide availability of vaccines. Some people won't take them because they're, they're wary of vaccines, they have their concerns, but I do think a lot of people will take them and those people are gonna feel like they can start to go on vacation. So with the vaccines coming, I expect to see a steady increase of the amount of people going on vacation. The next thing is that the Fed and Treasury are going to give out money. We have Janet Yellen and Jerome Powell. Both of them love supporting the economy with low interest rates and lots of uh, accommodating monetary policy, doing things like quantitative easing, doing things like financial stimulus. I think that we're going to see more of that in 2021. So that's going to help out individuals as well as businesses. And the last thing, of course, is that they have $3.7 billion in cash. That's a pretty hefty cash balance. This is going to get burned up really quickly if they keep losing money at the rate that they currently are. So this money will go away relatively quickly unless they can recover some of their business. So again, this is part of a timing game, but right now I think that Wynn does have a strong cash balance and they can ride this for a while longer without having to sell off any core assets or raise any more debt. Now that we've outlined some of the risks and potential downside and some of the bull case, let's go ahead and look at the current price of this stock. Right now it's trading at $100 a share. That means that it's down currently 30% year to date. So it's still down 30% of where it was trading from at the beginning of the year. It was down quite a bit further. It went down to 40 bucks a share at its lowest point and then it's since recovered quite a bit. And since the vaccine news, it's actually jumped up quite a bit more. So it's right now sitting at $100 a share. I think that that's a pretty good valuation for it, seeing as most of the time in this company's history, it trades above $100 a share. If we look at an all-time graph, there's many times where it trades $150, $200 a share when it has very profitable years. So that could happen in the future if they're able to regain their business, regain their cash flow and their net income, and they're able to pay down some of this debt. So all of this depends on how strong this business bounces back. If it bounces back very strong, becomes a profitable company, Wall Street's going to want to own this company and they'll bid up the price on it. But right now it's trading at $100 a share, which is a really good value for it historically. So if they're able to regain their business and regain their profitability, I could see this company trading back up next to where it was before the coronavirus in the range of the 120, 130, 140 range. If it does drag on longer, if things don't go well with the recovery and they have to burn all the way through their cash balance, this company could trade down quite a bit further. It could go down into the 70s or even below. So there's risk in both directions. I'm obviously optimistic that we'll see a strong recovery, but I can't see the future. So there are risks with this investment. Now let's talk about the dividend for a minute. I included this company in my passive income portfolio, which means I eventually expect to earn passive income from it. Right now, currently, Wynn Resorts is not paying a dividend. They canceled the dividend, they put it on hold because they're trying to weather the storm and they're trying to preserve as much cash as they can for their fixed expenses, which I think is smart to do. This is a once in a lifetime hopefully once in every 50 year type of event. We don't come across pandemics that are this damaging and go on for this long that frequently. So I don't see this type of thing repeating itself. And outside of these really black swan events like the coronavirus, Wynn has a very good business that consistently pays out its shareholders dividends. In fact, we can look at the dividend history. All these letter Ds here, these are when they've paid out dividends every single quarter for the past 10 years. They've done it consistently every quarter for the past 10 years without a hiccup. These ones up here that are way high are when they've paid out special dividends that are really big years. So they paid out a lot of extra cash to shareholders. So this company is a dividend paying stock. That's what they like to do. That's what they've done for the past 20 years. And under normal circumstances, this company will pay dividends again. So in my mind, buying the company right now at a cheaper share price, I'm expecting in the future, they will restate their dividend once their business is back and operational. I fully anticipate them to do that. And currently I'm collecting shares at a cheaper share price in hopes to get a better yield on cost. If they paid out the same dividend they did prior to coronavirus, you'd be getting a 4% yield currently, 
which is really good. So I'm not saying they'll return the dividend that quickly. I don't know how long it will take, but my expectations is that during 2021, they'll see a resurgence in their business. They'll try to shore up their balance sheet. And then 2022, I could see them reinstating a small dividend and starting to pay out shareholders again. And I expect that shareholders that buy right now, they'll be able to collect a lot of future dividends at a very high yield on cost. So that'll be a good deal for people that have been buying during this year. So in my mind, this is all a waiting game. We bought this small stake in this company. I have about $10,000 worth of shares right now. If the recovery goes really well and they return to profitability over the next year or two, they're gonna start paying dividends and this will be a really good cash flow company. I'll be able to earn a lot of cash flow from it. On the other hand, if the recovery does not go well, the coronavirus drags on and they get into a really bad situation with their debt and cash balances, then this one will be a holding that I likely lose money on. So I don't know what direction this is going to go, but my guess is that the recovery will be strong. So either way, we'll find out over the next couple of years and see how this plays out. Now, moving on to some news, we have the big story of the week, which is that Salesforce is buying Slack. And I think this is a really, really good buy for Salesforce. The deal is expected to be about half cash and half stock, the source has said, and will pick Slack at a premium. So some people are worried about the premium that Salesforce is paying for Slack. I think it's worth it. This would expand Salesforce's offering so much to have a chat application as high quality of Slack's built in, I think would be incredibly powerful for Salesforce and it would make Salesforce much more competitive with Microsoft. Microsoft launched their chat application, Microsoft Teams in 2016. And this graphic shows how quickly it raced away from Slack. It has taken over so much market share because Microsoft Teams has some advantages. Even though, in my opinion, Microsoft Teams is an inferior chat application, the fact that it's bundled together with all of Microsoft's products makes it so that it's at a better value proposition. So companies will pick Microsoft Teams over Slack knowing that Teams is probably an inferior chat application. And they do that simply because the cheaper price point and because Teams is integrated with the rest of Microsoft's offerings. These type of bundling of different products are so powerful that ironically Slack themselves accused Microsoft of anti-competitive practices for doing the same thing that they're kind of doing now. Slack alleges in the complaint that Microsoft abused its market dominance to eliminate competition for its teamwork communication product by tying it to a popular office productivity suite. So Slack is saying here, hey, Microsoft is being anti-competitive. They're breaking the rules by tying Microsoft Teams to Microsoft Office. That's breaking the rules because they're, they're tying it together with other products. Slack claims that move meant millions were forced to install the app without the ability to remove it. Slack runs a service that competes directly with Microsoft Teams. The ironic thing now is that Slack is probably going to be used in the exact same manner that Microsoft Teams was. Salesforce is certainly going to bundle it with the rest of their products. They're going to integrate it with the rest of their products. It's going to be a default part of their application. So the complaints that Slack had against Microsoft are now probably what they're going to be doing with Salesforce. So my guess is that this deal will go through just fine. I don't see this running into legal problems. And I think this is a very good purchase for Salesforce, even at the premium. Now, another news story that I wanna do a quick update on is our favorite company, Nikola. This is the automaker that doesn't make any vehicles. It's the electric hydrogen car mock-up company. Now, I've said before that if the deal falls through with GM, this stock is going down. That's the last straw holding this stock together is their deal with GM. GM was a big thing that gave them some sort of validation, some sort of legitimacy. And I thought that if that fell apart, then Nikola is really going to struggle. Well, now General Motors will no longer take a stake in Nikola. So they're backing away from Nikola as well. Even though they were holding out for as long as possible, they finally decided they got to cut ties in a way. The journal reports that under this new stripped down agreement revealed Monday, it is a significant retrenchment from the earlier pact that fueled investors' enthusiasm for both companies. So GM stepping away from this deal, saying they don't want to be a part of Nikola anymore, has really soured the excitement and enthusiasm a lot of investors had about Nikola. The Detroit automaker has also scrapped plans to build an electric pickup truck called the Badger for Nikola. So another vehicle, the Nikola Badger, is not being made by GM. That's one more thing that investors have been shown that doesn't seem like it's happening anytime soon. Now, looking at the stock price of Nikola, it has not been having a good week. The past five days, you could say that it's been in motion rolling down a hill. It's down 46.9% in the past five days. If we go to the past six months, you can see the stock price at $79 a share. So when it hits high, and it's going down and down and down, powered by gravity, and now it's at a price of 
$17. Things are currently a little bit of a rough patch for Nikola. So I'll keep you updated with this. We'll see from time to time where Nikola ends up. All right, let's move on and jump into some questions and comments. You can email in at joseph at josephcarlsonshow.com or you can leave a comment in the video. I check those as well. This first one's from Matthew. He says, hey Joseph, hopefully everything is going great with you. I wanna say thank you for all your videos you're making. It really helped me think about achieving financial freedom with the passive income. But the thing is I'm still new and I don't know really where to start. I just started working for a few months now, so I'm still low on income. Do you think I should start now or keep adding investments every paycheck I get? Thanks again, Joseph, stay safe. Well, congratulations on just starting working. You probably have a new job. You have some sort of income. First of all, if you're all brand new to this and you're just starting off, I would avoid picking individual companies to invest in. I would more focus on ETFs, at least with like 80% of your portfolio. I would put it into broader ETFs that give you diversification. So that right there erases a lot of work of starting to invest. You can pick out some ETFs that uh, target whatever companies you want. They give you broad exposure. And so you don't have to worry about stock picking, at least at the beginning. Now, if you're just starting a new job, you don't have to rush to put money into your portfolio, but I would not hold off investing because your income's low. You're never going to build wealth by earning money, working at a job, and then spending it. That will never build wealth. The way that you build wealth is by saving money and investing it. So you should get in the habit of doing that every single paycheck, even if it's 10 bucks a paycheck, $20 a paycheck. Anything to get you in the habit of continually investing on an incremental basis, I think is definitely worth the priority. So I would start off slow, maybe invest what you can safely at the moment. And in the meantime, try to grow your income by advancing your skill set with your work. So that's what I would do. I'd start off with an ETF. If you have a low income, I would put a low amount into your portfolio every week, but I'd get into the habit of doing that on an incremental basis. And in the meantime, work on advancing your skill sets, try to raise that income over time. Daniel says, hey, Joseph, I've been using M1 Finance for over a year now. For me personally, it's working well. When I go on Reddit, I read the comments and I see a lot of people complaining about the bad customer support. I know I saw their tweets and their video replies where they tell us they're trying to improve their customer support, but I am concerned. Are they really a safe place to invest? When you're investing in the five digits, you don't want this kind of support. How do you feel about keeping your portfolio in their hands? Sincerely, Daniel. Well, Daniel, do I feel comfortable keeping my money on M1 Finance. I currently have over, like, between my retirement and my main passive income portfolio, I probably have over $180,000 on M1 Finance. So I have a good amount of money on the platform. That was a big concern for me when I initially was starting to build it, was is this safe? What is this application? I did a lot of research on their insurance, on the way that the company was set up. It has all the proper protections, all the proper government scrutiny and regulations as well as I did some research on the company itself. It's a US-based company. It's very transparent. The CEO of it is Brian Barnes, who I know on a little bit of a personal level. I interviewed him on the show. So I know him and he's a guy that I trust. I think he's a really trustworthy person. So I don't have any big concerns with M1 Finance. I certainly don't have any more concerns with M1 Finance than I would with any other brokerage. I think that they have all the proper protocols, insurance, plus trustworthy leadership. Their customer service when you go on to online forums like Reddit, that surfaces a concentration of people that have had bad experiences. So there might be hundreds of thousands of users and a handful of them, like 40 or 50, have a really bad experience and they voice their complaint on one forum. Then it gives the appearance that there's a lot of people complaining about it when it's really a, a very small minority of people that tend to have bad experiences. I've seen the same thing happen with Ally Bank. If you go on to Ally Bank on Facebook, there's just people complaining about the customer service and different issues nonstop. And I've overall had no problems using Ally Bank. I think that the company runs fine. I've never had any issues. And so my experience differs with the people online, but I assume it's the same thing. They have millions of customers and a portion of them have bad experiences. They go and voice that online and it makes it look like there's a lot of people. So I wouldn't be too concerned about it. Everything that I've researched is that the company's trustworthy. It has good leadership. I've talked with the CEO personally. I trust them. They actually offer the best security with two-factor authentication that a lot of banks don't even offer. A lot of banks are doing SMS two-factor. So in some ways, I feel more secure with my money on M1 Finance than I do with it in a traditional bank. All right, that's going to be all for this episode. I have another one coming out this weekend. So if you want to see that episode, make sure you subscribe to the channel and I will talk to you guys then.